In the last video, we looked at the two types of architectures for speech recognition systems. There's the traditional architecture, which tries to break up the problem into separate pieces. And there's the end-to-end -end architecture that tries to go directly from the audio to the transcription using deep learning. Here we'll look at the traditional architectures, which were uh, developed in the 1980s and which are still incredibly useful for languages that don't have a lot of data. This is an example of a system from the 80s that could recognize 20,000 words. It was called Tangora, and it was based on hidden Markov models. Indeed, there were many early attempts at trying to perform speech recognition. On the World Fair in 1939, there was a machine that transformed uh, the frequencies in voice to a few select actions. Indeed, this is how early systems were built. The Autry system in 1952 was capable of recognizing digits from 0 to 9, but only from the voice of the person who made the system, because the system was made to filter out certain frequencies in the person's voice and then to write 0, 1, or 2, and so forth. The shoebox system from 1962 could recognize 16 words and perform arithmetic. But of course, they had to be very specific to the voice of a certain person because they depended on like specific positionings of frequencies. It was only in the 1980s when hidden Markov models were implemented that systems could go from recognizing a few dozen words to tens of thousands of words. And what these systems did was try to observe the probability of a certain Set, uh, set of features in the spectrogram corresponding to the probability of a word. And these are the parts of such a system. For example, um, the system would first be trained on recordings and transcriptions. And what this system would like try to learn is two things. First, it would try to build an acoustic model where it would try to figure out the probability of a certain set of phonetic features, of spectrographic features, given a word that it has seen in the training set, or a phone, or a bigram, and so forth. So it would try to match the units in the training set, which would be phones or there could be words, to certain patterns in the spectrographic signal and derive probabilities for them. The system would also train a language model, like the n-grams we studied on week four, so that it could figure out the probability of certain sequences of words, so that it could know that the sequence recognize speech is probably very frequent in our data, but the sequence rec a nice beach is probably very infrequent in our data. Once you have trained the system, you would input a new audio file, which could give you a set of spectrographic features X. You extract the features, and then you pass it through the acoustic model. And then you would try to figure out what are the words that could correspond to these spectrographic signals. Or, for example, what are the individual phones or sequences of phones that could correspond to the spectrographic signal. From that, the acoustic model would, would assemble a string of units, maybe a string of phones, a string of biphones, or biograms of phones, a string of triphones, a trigram of phones, and or even a string of words, of individual words, one and the other. It would then pass this to be evaluated by the language model. So the language model would try to to tell you if that sequence made sense in the language. So for example, if you have uh, two candidates for a transcription, recognize speech and rec a nice speech, the system would tell you that one transcription is very likely and the other one, not so much. From this, the computer would output a potential transcription, a W star string, which has the units of the potential transcription of the speech features X. Let's go one step at a time. The first thing the computer would try to do is analyze the spectrogram and divide it into a set of windows. And each of them would be about five milliseconds, quite simply because speech is very fast and uh, nothing in speech lasts more than 
uh, 100 or 200 milliseconds, for example. Even consonants can be extremely short in the tens of milliseconds. So the spectrogram would be divided into short windows, and from each of them you would extract the energies at certain frequencies, the velocity of change of the energy, if it's changing very fast or very slowly. You would also extract the intensity or the volume. The system Deep Speech, for example, extracts 39 pieces of information from each window. Once you have that, you send the extracted information to um, essentially a classification system, so which would tell you out of this set of spectrographic information, what is the probability that it corresponds to the k in cat, for example, or the t in telephone. Again, this is a classification system trying to classify a set of features into a category. And people have used every algorithm we have studied in class. Um, hidden Markov models were implemented in the 1980s and they were very successful because they measured the probability of a certain signal being cat or then switching from the K of cat to the A of cat, for example. So these use probabilities and were very successful in the early systems. People have used some supervised uh, clustering, like K-star clustering, to see if the sound that you get corresponds more to a K or more to a T. People have used support vector machines to, again, try to derive the probability that something is classified as a K or a T. People have used neural networks, uh, deep learning networks, to try to learn the probabilities. Any kind of classifier that you can think of, people have tried to implement for this problem. The, the important thing here is, what exactly are we trying to predict? Out of this Im input from the spectrogram, what units are we trying to get as the output? Early systems tried to get whole words so that you have a chunk of spectrogram and the computer would tell you this corresponds to the word one, this corresponds to the word two. More modern systems used phones and they try to see in each chunk, maybe this looks like an F, maybe this looks like a schwa, maybe this looks like a T, as in the word pho photography, for example. The more phones you use for your prediction units, the better the performance will be. And this is because of a phenomenon called corticulation. So this is another source of variation for sounds. Um, because of the mechanical effort that uh, you have to make to move your tongue from one position to the other, neighboring sounds are going to influence how your tongue positions itself. For example, the K in keep has a higher energy than the K in coop. And this is because this one is more fronted. The vowel is more fronted, and in this one, the vowel is more back. So these are going to shift around the center of energy for the K, even though it's the same K, but because it's co-articulated with its vowel, it's going to change a little bit. So some systems try to predict not that this is a K and this is an I, but that this sequence is key and this sequence is cool, for example. This is good because it will have more precision for the ones it knows, but it means that the units that you have to classify explode and become hundreds if not thousands because of all the possible combinations of biphones and triphones. Once you have a certain sequence, cut, for example, then the model tries to figure out what is the probability that that sequence corresponds to a word that it knows. That there is a sequence cut that is uh, similar to the one described for cat. The probability of this would be very high. If the sequence that it captured was something like word, for example, the probability would be very low that this corresponds to the word cat. Once you have figured out a string of first of phones and then a string of words, you pass that to the language model and then have the language model make a judgment of whether your string makes sense or not. If you have two candidates, recognize speech and recognize speech, this one will have a higher probability than recognize speech. And so this is the one that's going to emerge as the potential candidate.
How do you train a language model? The same way we did before. You have the transcription of your recordings. This is a great song. This is a terrible song. And then you calculate probabilities for individual unigrams, for bigrams, for trigrams, and so forth. And once you have the words, you can send that to a parser, for example. So if you have Siri and you tell Siri, play Old Town Road, the computer will recognize the words, send them to a dependency parser, and hopefully it will determine that the root of that sentence is play and the direct object is Old Town Road. That is what we're trying to get. In summary, how does it do it? It gets the acoustic signal, and from there it tries to classify different windows of the signal as different phones, for example. And it can do it with any type of classifier. Hidden Markov models have been a classic for how this is done, but any kind of classifier you can think of, someone has tried to plug into this position. Once you have the probabil probabilities for phones, you try to put together words out of those phones. And then you try to figure out if the sequence of words that you guessed makes sense with the language model. For those of you that are mathematically inclined, X is the series of acoustic features and W is the words. So the uh, prediction W star is the maximum probability of the words given the acoustic features that we saw, which is equal to the maximum of this multiplication, of this chain, of the probability of the features given a certain group of words that we know, multiplied by the probability of the words as described in the language model. And these are the parts of the system. You give it an audio signal, it tries to decode the phones and the words, it then runs the words through the language model, and then it provides a candidate transcription. How do we evaluate that it's working? We can use uh, metrics like word error rate, which just tells you how many words it transcribed wrong. As you can see, this is a test on two types of uh, Cobra, Switchboard and Call Home. And these are some examples of the classifiers that people have plugged into the um, acoustic model position. As you can see, LSTMs, for example, reach a word error rate of 7% for English. This is a corpus for English. So it means that it's getting things more than 92% correct. And by things, I should say words, not more than 92% correct. Call home is a more spontaneous corpus. So it gets a little bit more error, about 12.2%. So it only correctly transcribes about 87% of the words. Another possible metric is out of vocabulary words which we have seen before. It's just how many words it tags as unknown, or it couldn't even determine what they were. In summary, traditional uh, speech recognition systems break the problem into separate parts. They try to identify phones. From the phones, they try to identify words, and then they try to figure out the probability of those words to produce an output. We can try to train the system to recognize words, phones, or combinations of phones for more accuracy. And some of the metrics that we can use are word error rates and out of vocabulary words.